Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Good to see you back in the plenary room. And um, it's my job just to chair the closing session for today. And, um, and we, the goal is to finish ahead of schedule because there is definitely a beer with my name on it. Uh, and I kind of feel I've earned it. So, uh, so I'm going to chair rather tightly. Um, I hope that you all found the parallel sessions, despite the load-shedding dramas, that you found it really enriching, and you found your tribes, you enjoyed um, uh, recognizing your, your fellow tribes, people, and that you also got such deep pleasure from hearing about people's empirical work, right? That makes such a difference always to be together because one can actually experience and enjoy um, um, the fruits of the craft of uh, collecting data, making sense, and feeding that back into our larger conversations. Now, one of the things that I am particularly delighted about how today unfolded and how Liza has been leading this process is that it feels like this conference, uh, a little bit like the one in 2018, but especially today, that there's a real generational shift happening, that there's a different intellectual and academic leadership emerging. And I'm therefore delighted that we have the very, very old um, of the current generation, um, in some ways the godfather, <laughs> <laughs> the godfather on the panel to do the, the, the honors of formally handing over and, uh, and, and, and the stars of the next generation uh, sharing with us today um, what sense they've made, what they've learned, and so on. And, um, and so I'm not going to uh, assume that you can't read, and so I won't speak to their bios, which is in the program, so that's referenced. And I will immediately hand over to my colleague, Liza Cherulia, uh, to kick us off. And then we will have Wangui, and then Malik uh, will close off their reflections. And, uh, and then we'll have an opportunity for all of you to, to engage. Thank you. OK, fantastic. Do I need to stand behind this thing, or can I no, stand forward? No, you can forward? stand anywhere. Okay, great. So if, for those of you who know me, you know I actually can't see properly. So the slides are up here, and I'm actually going to have to read them from over here. This is a, an incredible getup also to be in. I was saying I feel like sort of Madonna or Britney Spears. Um, anyway, I'm going to be speaking today very quickly, wrapping up a couple of ideas, reflecting a little bit on some of the sessions that I was in. Um, and I've called this, uh, this very short, I'll call it an intervention. People like calling things that. Techno ambivalence, infrastructure, and uncertain uh, urban futures. And it's just a few thoughts on what we've spoken about today, but framed within what I consider to be a much longer conversation that today really has built upon. So we now have, I mean, 20 years of humanities and social science scholarship on, on questions of infrastructure, right? And so we're now building, not just sort of trying to make the case as scholars of the importance of infrastructure, but we're actually building on lots and lots and lots of work in this specific domain. And under this kind of wide umbrella, we also know that urban studies has contributed significantly to these debates. So it's not just infrastructure in the sort of national or even supranational sense, but actually questions of what is the urban and what is happening in and around cities. So under this kind of loose umbrella of, of the urban, we have this kind of infrastructure turn that, that sort of emerges about 20 years ago, and which many of our work, I think, speaks directly into. And despite, and I know that Edgar picked this up on many of our kind of previous uh, engagements here, despite the relatively limited amount of contributions that the African uh, kind of urban theory debates have, have had across the world, what we do see is a pretty significant contribution to the urban infrastructure conversations. We see really fundamental questioning of, of concepts, things like leapfrogging or transitioning or even failure have really emerged in many ways and have been pushed through conversations happening on the continent, or at least 
about things happening on the continent. I think that's a really important thing to say because so, you know, we often talk about how African scholarship does not contribute to debates, but I think this is a space where we can say we actually have, and in the last five years, we can actually see really major contributions coming through from, from, this, from scholars on the continent here. Um, one of the kind of places where this debate has been particularly fertile, I think, has been in this question of splintering urbanism and really in the networked infrastructure ideal. It's been one of the key sites of kind of resonance and crystallization and debate that, that has uh, taken place in the last, I would say, five to six years uh, here. And as it goes, of course, the sort of uh, splintering urbanism or, or networked infrastructure ideal argument is that this sort of centralized, uniform, large-scale infrastructure is you know, our, our best option for amortizing really large costs over long time frames for creating universal access, for thinking about cross-subsidization across different user groups. And you know, processes of neoliberal policy reform, structural adjustment, financialization have obviously challenged this, broken it apart, and have challenged this otherwise kind of sustained ideal. Of course, many scholars in this room have pushed back on that question in really serious ways, and I think that concepts around heterogeneity, hybridity, the post-networked city have all asked us whether or not this ideal is in fact probable, possible, even something that is admirable. And the scholars, many of the scholars in this room have asked these questions and have challenged us to th really think about the way in which decentralization, distribution, democratization of different kinds of material configurations potentially allow for us to think about different future ideals. And a whole lot of, oh, that's awkward looking, sorry. A whole lot of vocabularies of hybridity have emerged, right? And we see so many of the concepts that are on this table here have come from people in this room. And we think about sort of pirate infrastructure arrangements. We think about people as infrastructure. We think about incomplete networks. And so many discourses and, and concepts are, are really emerging. And I think that's a really beautiful and generative thing, that we have new words, new ideas. And actually, the material reality has actually really started to challenge this binary, even between the networked infrastructure ideal and questions of hybridity, off-gridedness, decentralization. We see lots and lots of cases and examples where we see things that sit somewhere in between, and they, they really don't attend to what have commonly been understood as sort of spaces, decentralization or hybridity for just for informality or just for elite enclaves. We see instead a whole lot of spectrums of hybridity emerging. We see the state pushing decentralized infrastructure for, for transport or for sanitation. We see, we see venture capital pushing all sorts of large-scale infrastructure. We see all sorts of more complicated stories than I think what the sort of earlier questions of hybridity and heterogeneity enabled us to imagine. And so, for example, in these kind of interrogations, we see the way that the state or the middle class are constructed in and through new emerging hybrid configurations. We see the way in which a whole lot of really complex tensions emerge, for example, between questions of greenness, justness, and jobs. Um, and, we, and we definitely think about what is implicated in these kind of contextualized arrangements. Um, this allows us to resist in some ways the kind of techno-determinism that I think has uh, emerged in some of the infrastructure conversations and we spoke in some of the, the debates today about you know, is large-scale infrastructure bad or good, is small-scale infrastructure bad or good and we're able to kind of suspend ourselves between these possibilities and think beyond whether or not a particular technology in fact engenders outcomes in, in, uh, that are more or less just. But this kind of leaves us somewhat suspended and we don't always necessarily are able to find our way through that. It shores up lots of complexity, but doesn't necessarily tell us what direction we need to be looking or thinking. Um, I mean, is that the job of the academic? I think lots of people would say, no, you can just shore up all that complexity and leave it there. Someone else must figure out what to do with it. But of course, Edgar pushes us this morning and reminds us that in fact, uh, we are here in part because we are compelled by the project of propositionality. We are compelled to direct and to imagine what is po not just possible or happening, but what is actually potentially good or just. 
Um, of course, equally, many of us are compelled by funders to do this, and I've had long, long rants about the British government and the German government and their ideas of what impact and, and uh, you know, relevance looks like, and I'll park that. You can talk to me about it later if you're interested. But I'm thinking more here along the propositional agendas, not the ones that are being kind of pushed upon us by the development community, but more about the ones that we ourselves here in this room are interested in, in engaging with and in, interested ourselves in pushing. So, thinking about along those lines of propositionality and Edgar's call to be both simultaneously critical and propositional, there's a couple of questions that came to me throughout the day. And the first one, oh, sorry, I love bureaucracies. It's actually one of my favorite topics is the politics of bureaucracy. So if you're confused about why this picture is here, it's because of that. Um, the first is that have we been sufficiently critical? That's the first question. It's like us in the room today, we've, we've brought in lots of disciplines. People have spoken, they've spoken about their work. Do we feel like this, we were able to be sufficiently critical together, collectively, of one another, and in a kind and generative way? And do we, or have we been willing to contest one another and do we know how to do that in ways that allow us to be productive? Um, in general, I, I think that certain academic cultures are highly critical, nasty in fact. Other academic cultures are sort of pleasant or, uh, and they say thank you, but then they complain about you later. Are we actually creating the domains here to actually have robust conversations? The next one is, are our ideals around justice, around sustainability, robust enough to actually point us in propositional futures, right? And if we go back to the splintering urbanism hypothesis, we know that they were very clear about the direction they wanted to go, right? Networked infrastructure ideal was you know, your best option for a whole range of very clear reasons. But as we move into a sort of celebration of heterogeneity, of hybridity, of, in, of decentralization, do we really know which direction we're going in and do we have the kind of robustness in our theoretical frameworks to be able to help us discern? This is also a practical question because city governments, the sorts of people that we're going to be speaking with tomorrow are being bludgeoned with all sorts of technological options. How do they discern which ones they should be actually putting attention towards? How do they critique the options that are being put on the table for them? Are we helping them make, make these kinds of frameworks that allow for them to see these things? And finally, have we engaged sufficiently with the various pathways towards reconfiguration? So this is the question of, of how we actually get there, not really what we're looking for. And for me, the question of urban statecraft, the question of social mobilization, political life, have we actually thought about these questions of how one engenders change in complex systems? And, and, I, and I push that back to everyone. It's like we've been talking a lot about, a lot about visionaries, imaginaries. Have we thought about how one actually gets there? So, and finally, in a globalized world where value chains are really long, where ideas circulate widely, where the future is deeply uncertain, are we, do we have the vocabulary to world as much as to place? And this seems like a tension that we keep going back and forth to, and, and it's something that I wanted to throw back to the group. So my main takeaways from today were acknowledging a couple of things that I, that I saw coming through in the different sessions. The first is the trade-offs between scale, infrastructural scales, time horizons, and ideological orientations. And this came through so many times in the panels. The second is the sort of technical and material substance as much as the affective and political. We saw more technical presentations, we saw more affective and political presentations. Are we able to match these up? Are we able to have those conversations simultaneously? The third is the relationship between problematization, imagined response, and actual mobilization. So this goes back to my, to my earlier point, is the way we conceptualize problems, the way we then engender responses, and then how we actually create pathways to get there. And finally, the risks and the likelihood that we're all probably really wrong about all of it, and whether or not we're prepared to still put propositions on the table as scholars who are so scared of being wrong, who are so scared of being critiqued, are we prepared to, in this kind of messy world, to actually put ideas out and be okay with the fact that many of them might be deeply, deeply wrong as the very unfuture certain, unfuture, uncertain future <laughs> emerges, so thank you. I also feel very fancy, but I don't know. Can, you can hear me okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. So I know the, the title for this session is uh, Creating Pathways for Infrastructure Futures. And I really 
don't know if I know much about uh, creating pathways for infrastructure future, so I can go home if you want. Should I go home? <laughs> no? Okay, good. Uh, instead, I will talk to you briefly about a critical urban studies workshop for African cities that many of us uh, are trying to do in Nairobi. And it's called Utadu. I don't know, has anyone been to Nairobi? Does, it, does anyone know the phrase Utadu? Uh, I can tell by your acknowledgement that you're a bit, uh, you're not sure where this is going because Utadu is somehow a smarmy comment. <laughs> but for us, it's a, we're using it as an acronym, but it's a, it's a way, it's kind of a smarmy, kind of brash uh, question that many ask in Nairobi, but we're using it in a different way. I'll just, to try and uh, evidence this, I'll just show you a brief video of someone embodying Utadu a little bit. Uh, you can go ahead. Oh, sorry, I haven't. There. <laughs> uh, you can put the video, thank you. So that face, imagine someone saying Utadu is that face. Yeah, uh, 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 like maze niko home, nimekosa form uh, Na chukua phone, na pigia jump jump Boss from the club, nika sema wazi Leo ni ma drink, so na watch and die Utadu, 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 Thank you Utadu, utadu, So you can hear utadu, can you hear how people are saying utadu? And so for us, UTADU is an acronym because you need good acronyms in academia. <laughs> but it stands for Urban Thinking Africa Doing. And what we are trying to do is build on this uh, kind of UTADU, this questioning, this brash questioning, but also some of the resignation implied by UTADU, which is really what are you going to do about it in, in Sheng or in Swahili. Uh, so building on both the the proposition that that implies, the utadu, or as well as sometimes the resignation that is there. But utadu is also a slippery trickster phrase, which we can take up another day. But what is utadu? Utadu really is, um, uh, we launched this year, it's a, uh, it's a critical urban studies workshop, and um, we have, really what we are trying to do is have five days of being together and thinking together, and we have three days of theory, one day of working with activists and artists in Nairobi. It's geared for PhD students and early career scholars, but in our inaugural session, we had even people in their undergrad. And what was the, because there's so many workshops in the world, what, what, why did we uh, start and why did we come together to do what I do? And I'm, tr I'm going to try and capture these motivations in three, kind of broad uh, statements. So first, we wanted to make the party bigger. You know, every time I go for a workshop, except this one because half of Nairobi is in this workshop, so that, <laughs> but every time I, I go for a workshop, it's usually only me and Prince. I don't know how many of you know Prince. <laughs> I'm so tired of seeing Prince. Prince is so tired of seeing me. I've seen Prince in Singapore. I've seen <laughs> Prince everywhere, but we always think, isn't there anyone else in East Africa who knows what urban studies is? Why is it only me and you who show up here? But obviously there are many structural reasons that shape uh, the, the fact that we see each other a lot in these workshops. And so Utadu wants to make this party bigger, not just because Prince is tired of seeing me or I'm tired of seeing Prince, but because we want to create a space where young Kenyans or young Ugandans can have the imagination to think that there is something called urban studies. I didn't even know what urban studies was until I had someone who, who guided me. We want to have a space where we can think together about infrastructure otherwise, about different propositions, but also to, to foster a sensibility that the city is, is ours. It's not for just for city hall or it's not to be written about in uh, urban studies journal without us thinking about what the city means. And so we want to make the party bigger to, yeah, to share this space where we can have uh, this, this urban sensibility. And now in our inaugural event in May, uh, we had 90, we didn't know how, whether it would be successful, but we had 90 applications from uh, across the region and we ended up having 35 participants from Ghana, Angola, Ethiopia, Malawi, South Africa, Tanzania, all came to Nairobi self-paid to be in this room to collectively have this, to, 
foster this imagination. And so we can see that there's definitely a need to make the party bigger. So that's one motivation. We also want to fill each other's libraries. Uh, when I was in school many years ago, despite Edgar saying I'm young, I'm, I'm really quite ancient. But when I was uh, in school in the early 2000s, uh, I spent one year in the University of Dar es Salaam and we couldn't borrow books because there were really no books or the books for your subject were not there. Recently, when I was teaching at Kenyatta University, my students had never seen a journal article and they would never have access to it because it was behind a paywall. I didn't even have access to that, a paper I had written because it was behind a paywall. And so, uh, but while I flagged libraries really what I mean by libraries is trying to create, uh, libraries are a metaphor for giving each other resources. So we're trying to fill each other's libraries. And uh, at Utadu, we share resources, we share knowledge, we have our lovely intellectual comrades from different spaces who give free lectures. And we also, because we know resources are really hard for many early career scholars, we give five grants for a thousand shillings, uh, sorry, not definitely not a thousand shillings, but a thousand dollars each. We have no, we're not structural adjustment programs, so we don't have conditions. And we just give you one thousand dollars, just do your research, take the time to think, uh, to reflect, to complete projects, much of what is not available in, in our institutions. So, by filling each other's libraries, we're trying to create networks, supportive networks, share resources, books, and also give grants, uh, because we really need to try and fill each other's lives in these ways. And finally at Utadu, what we also try and do is say, no more native informants. There's so many young Africans who are just collect data forever. They never get an opportunity to uh, do PhDs, they're just there, perpetually, and their names will be circulated in these circuits of academic, uh, you know, repositories, but they never move forward. And so uh, we want to, for this and other reasons, we want well, no, more informant, uh, no more native informants, but we also want to democratize, in the small ways that we can, uh, knowledge production, because Africa only contributes to 1% of the global literature in journals, so I can't even imagine what percent of urban studies we contribute, even if you're all doing amazing work. And I, I think about this because when I was doing research, I have very many defiant friends, and importantly, and one of them asked me, do you want, are you interviewing me because you want a native informant as a rubber stamp, or do you want participatory justice? And he was referring to, he's probably been the, in, been interviewed a million times by everyone, and he only maybe finds, if at all, himself in the acknowledgements. And so, for Utadu, a big principle and what we are trying to do is to emphasize that Africa is not just the site for data collection that needs to go to Europe or North America or Japan to become theory. People are making theory here every day in many collaborative and intersubjective ways. And I'm not saying this and to, um, when I talk about, sorry, I've just missed something. I'm not saying that, yeah, really, ultimately we, we need to democratize knowledge production and we need, above all, young scholars to theorize and valorize. We really need to valorize, besides theorizing, uh, the various praxis that emerge in and through the African spaces. So com committently theorizing and valorizing and having space together to look inwards, outwards and, and uh, together. And while I, I know that we, are, we need to democratize knowledge, I also need to emphasize that so many people in this room, some of them sitting here, have given us the space to be able to stand and have done a lot of work to argue that about the importance of theory emerging from our continent every day, and so we are grateful, maybe the next generation, we're not sure, uh, for the space to stand and to make sure other people can stand to do, these, to do this work. And so by these broad objectives of 
making the party bigger, filling each other's libraries and uh, no more native informants. We want to make a small contribution at, at Utadu to enabling a more inclusive, hopefully a more joyful, because academia sometimes is not very joyful. <laughs> inclusive, supportive, joyous, and decolonial urban studies. And how do we do this? Uh, so we had, a, I'm sorry this font is so small, but we had our first session this year in May, 22nd to 20, 23rd to 27th, and we had sessions on uh, black geographies, the Anthropocene, queering and gendering the city, uh, urban infrastructure and governance. So we had all of these sessions. It's really quite intensive. I'm not sure how many of you are there, but that really focus on not only capturing the main uh, points being put forward, but contextualizing, reading it through our own spaces. This year, oh, sorry, in 2023, we also want to have sessions on disability, on climate change. So at the same time that we are trying to reflect on global theory, we also want to think about uh, theories that make our cities more inclusive, that create space for everyone. Um, and to do this, we need money, not a lot, but we need money. And we've had, so far, we've had some support from VREF, both in kind and monetary from ACC, from the Global Urban History Project and from the British Institute for Eastern Africa in Kenya. But besides this money, what helps us move forward and what helps us push forward these goals is a village. And some of the villagers in this village include Liza, include Alma. I don't know where Alma is hiding. But Alma actually uh, did our logo for us. It include, includes Andrea and Kenny uh, and many other people. And so. In less than a year, we, from Utadu, we've had, really, we've created this network of over 35 scholars from across the continent, young ones. We've had PhD applications. We've had a music video that was funded. <laughs> I can show that to you later. We also, as a side note, have had some romances, which I think are a good, a good metric for any successful conference. <laughs> And I'll be watching the cocktail to make sure that some of that romance happens here too. But really, we've had really ultimately critical friendships um, that are, are allowing us to pursue infrastructure and a different kind of infrastructure. Edgar earlier said that infrastructure offers a conceptual and political opportunity space to recast intersectional crises as an opportunity to imagine and instantiate alternatives. So Utadu also aspires to be this kind of infrastructure that uh, recasts intersectional crises, uh, that imagines opportunities. And I hope we can all join this village asking each other Utadu, like this guy, um, so that we can plant some seeds for many African infrastructures. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Edgar, Edgar, this morning, um, Recommended a film. I'd like to propose a double feature. So uh, these remarks are based on uh, Saul Williams and Anisia Uzeman's film, uh, Neptune Frost. Uh, it's a film that um, points to a poetics of, ref of refusal that is technical all the way through, but a sense of technicity which really stretches our notion of what, of what, that, what that is with particular kinds of interactions between code and music, um, touch, uh, that really in, in some ways enriches our understanding of the technical. And also materializes what perhaps is the, the greatest attainment of black study, which is the exploration of human life beyond the human form or what Sylvia Winter has in another context called the new ceremony. 
And in today's ceremony, we have spent the day listening to many generative propositions, many accounts of what is possible to do right now, or could be possible given the money and the determination to build judiciously. For we know that infrastructural failures and insufficiencies are not simply the lagging behind of rollouts, matters of affordability, or political will but rather failure are active designs to curate collective bodies, always second guessing the viability of their aspirations and even survival. Of their concerns about how they can adequately be connected to others and their survival as to obviate any need to always compete with them or undermine their endurance. If infrastructure is about connection, and if connections to the basic resources necessary to survive, to make things, to extend the capacities and temporalities of liveliness and industriousness are distributed equi equitably across the social landscape, then certain elemental connections among people are assured. People then belong to a conviction that they are in this together, whatever the this might be that they need not ask incessant questions about who will survive and who will not, and to what extent will my actions compromise your survival and yours mine. Yet if failure is in part the objective, the tacit effort to curtail the possibilities of collective action, to engender deficiencies that are then attributed to the very character of a particular people, the technical and financial dimensions of infrastructure can only be considered in the context of Africa's often overwhelming exposure to premature death. And the extent to which this death is enjoyed in certain quarters. Enjoyed not only as an affirmation of privilege, accomplishment, or relief, but as the very rationale for the prolongation of rule. If so many bodies are absented and have suffered, then it is necessary to take extraordinary measures to rectify or to move the people out of such debilitating darkness. Across much of Africa, both livability and impossible lives have been materialized in an intensive proximity. Here, the trajectories of development seem to carry with them their own simultaneous impossibility. They will never be what they set out to be. Whatever is planned or expected will only ever be partially the case. And such partiality represents less either an inflation of imagination or a failure of implementation. Rather, it has become the very logic of urban development itself. As such, development across the world takes on seemingly generic character, the same old investments, the same old part partnerships, gentri gentrifications, land valuations, and construction styles. It would appear that the convergence policymakers have referred to for decades at least takes on the semblance of a material form, even if historical and political conditions provide plenty of differentiation. African cities have long housed both the living and the dead. They have long been platforms for the exertion of ancestral forces. They have long had to accommodate the realities of so many people and things that have gone on. Gone on to a plane that is not, that, that is not over there, not beyond any existence, but still here, even if visible and conversant in a different way. A way that exceeds conventional verification. Fundamental connections are retained to such forces sometimes in ways that became, become more viable, more important than the connection people might attain in the same neighborhood or the same city. These more social connections may be changing all of the time because the fundamental enduring connections are elsewhere across different scales and media of temporality and because the struggles for better infrastructure can't quite outpace the intentions of failure. As such, hundreds of new words and gestures appear in cities on a weekly basis. Time zones proliferate, where some individuals live literally in the end of days, the apocalypse, others in some futuristic warp, 
and still others in an endless present of putting bread on the table. Actions can be excessively generous or cruel without apparent reasons, as is the coupling of bodies and materials. The interrelationships of these connections give rise to urban actors to which the usual attributions perhaps make little sense. All of these intersections of various temporalities within intense proximity cannot be apprehended, cannot be apprehended in both the sense of being understood or captured by prevailing frameworks of law or state policy. But they nevertheless are subject to such apparatuses, fall under their purview, and are compelled to have some kind of relationship with them. The everyday tensions and challenges that arise from the elements of these intersections, working or not working together, are managed largely by improvised mechanisms necessary to deal with constantly shifting dilemmas. So how to reconcile the everyday politics then to the demands of infrastructural planning and technicity, particularly as we seem to wait for grids, adequate supplies of fuel, expanded broadband capacity, efficient sanitation systems, and so forth. African cities always seem to exist in the meantime. In the meantime, while we are waiting, we will do this. We will practice a myriad of small experiments, off-grid, improvised, replete with small sustainabilities. We wait for all the sclerotic generations of big men to finally go and for all those well-trained, brilliant African technicians to assume the mantles of power and act in the general interest. But what appear to be the defining vulnerabilities of African cities are difficult to navigate in terms of clear-cut meanings and implications. At the level of the prolongation of life, of life as an evolving potentiality of flourishing and sustenance, the ethical and political imperatives would seem clear-cut informing a trajectory of meeting basic needs, providing for adequate levels of work, and of maximizing the values of human and material resources. But on the other hand, it is vulnerability as a structural underpinning of the availability of people and things to each other, of the capacity of people and things to be rearranged and the concomitant generativity of new combinations of elements to create multiple courses of action and thus endurance, that has underwritten urbanization processes in large swathes of Africa, in conjunction with an array of political technologies. It is not easy to disentangle availability as precarity and subjugation and availability as generative resource and capacity. In fact, it's impossible to disentangle. We have to live with this doubleness. So-called modern cities have always taken the energies, experiments, and styles of their different human and non-human inhabitants and contracted them, both in the sense of truncating these practices and establishing contractual relationships defining the rights and responsibilities of urban citizens. This contraction may provide urban actors with new opportunities for looking, understanding, and organizing themselves. It may provide a framework for how to pay attention to all that goes on in the city and for understanding what it is possible to do and how to do it. But it also takes them from that, but also takes from them sensibilities, inclinations, and a vast set of provisional accomplishments for working with others and using the city and repackages them in ways that are often difficult to recognize and be reclaimed as their own. Therefore, we are left with the seemingly endless conundrum of development paradigms where governing cities is the issue of the political management of complex trade-offs that must be made by all cities in a context of sometimes painful global exposure. The trade-offs concern to what extent, for example, fiscal soundness takes precedence over the equitable delivery of urban services or the extent to which managerial proficiency supersedes expanded popular participation in decision-making. The critical issue is how these trade-offs are defined. Who is involved in negotiating them? What are the appropriate forms of community organization and mobilization 
in a context where urban government is increasingly less capable of meeting the demands of all citizens? How does one combine, relate, and balance different forms of participation, negotiation, contestation, and partnership to ensure vibrant politics and constructive collaboration to solve real problems? Part of the problem is that not enough attention is paid to the hundreds of small deals, small transactions, and provisional accommodations worked out in backroom, ba worked out in backroom banquet halls behind food stalls and night markets, in glitzy rundown casinos, and in the courtyards of neighborhood mosques, all places where different claims, tactics, and senses of things intersect. But all of, these, all of these gatherings, all of these assemblages, all of these kinds of negotiations are not done so much in terms of trying to defend particular understandings of, of human life. Rather, they're undertaken primarily to looking for different kinds of forms, different kinds of forms and ways of being together that are not obligated, indebted to the values of the past, that always try to break through the kind of capture of the human form on sensibilities that so much overspill them. So in some ways, the, re the Africa is full of different kinds of noise. Michel Serre reminds us that the, the, the basis of any proposition is noise, and there's noise all around. There's the noise of, of women's algorithmic societies in Kundu Kaduna running code labs. There's the, there's the noise of of uh, GIS counter-mapping observatories in the back streets of Agadez. And there's the noise of, collect of hackers' collectives who operate under the official managerial arm running the, 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 uh, uh, the Ottoman port of, of, of a Pont, Pont Noir. So perhaps in future convocations, we can turn up the volume. We can, we can incorporate and bring some of that noise to these kinds of urban, urban deliberations that we might make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. So the intention of the last 10 minutes or so is not to specifically engage with or ask questions, but is for you to offer up any reflection, insight, um, polemic you want to share uh, in the sort of dying embers of the day. And um, <laughs> so, so feel free, there is a microphone at large that Alma's carrying. And, um, and can we have the lights up for the audience, please? Thanks. Um, anyone who feels moved Um, no? Everyone is... Ah, there's... Okay, great, thanks. Th thanks very much, uh, Prof. Thank you for, uh, for the presentations. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thanks. Th thanks. Um, my name is Tumani. Uh, I'm a subject of the colony. Um, I was really interested to, to make sense of the idea of infrastructure in a colonial city such as the city of Cape Town. How do we make sense of the colonial city that refuses to become an African city? And, and of course, the remarks by the prof, he talks about complex trade-offs. I just, during the day I just came from a meeting in, in one of the townships, Kualanga, where there are um, liquid traders who are trying to operate in the business sector selling alcohol. And these liquid traders, they're struggling to get the license from the city. And when they don't have the license from the city, 
their alcohol is taken, illegally so, by the police, by the law enforcement. And now, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining now who's here to represent such voices of the people who are supposedly part of this colonial city, when the city seeks constantly, I mean this, of course you can speak as, as far as the 1960s history of South Africa, that black people are not allowed to sell alcohol. And today that history is revisited. And now when you talk about the, the African infrastructure, I'm left but to ask myself, who are you talking about? If the very Africans are not here in this hall to talk about their experiences of a city. Of course, for them, a colonial city, that still treat them as the other. They're not part of the city, they're in the periphery of the city, they're struggling to be part of the city. And I'm interested, therefore, to just maybe what the panelists think of what one of my friends call, be careful of white people's feelings. They can become a law. How white people feel, whether this evening or tomorrow, be very careful, because those feelings might become a law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other? Yeah, Jenny. Thank you for such a great uh, final panel um, and for the day. So the, I have three phrases I've written down here from the discussions. One is Malik's, uh, two from Malik and one from Edgar, says intentions of failure. So this is really important because I think a lot of discussion goes on about emergent um, formations of uh, or informal solutions to infrastructure failure but the intentions of failure, we don't often talk about that. I thought that was a very uh, important phrase. So how come middle income countries can't tar their roads? Uh, the intentions of failure are very important to um, understand. In that context though, the imp imperfect experiments that Edgar was talking about become a you know, temporal reality. What is one to do? <laughs> And I think um, this is something that I've taken from various works of uh, the ACC and the initiatives that have been made in many contexts. And it's a real, uh, you know, to think between those two things. Mm -hmm. And then the final one, joyful noise. <laughs> you know, in a sense, opportunities and possibilities. And I thought, for me, that um, framed uh, things that I'm going to take away and really mull over. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think we're there. Um, I'm just gonna give the panelists an opportunity to have a final reflection if they have anything uh, to say. So Malik is a no, Eliza is a no. Uh, so Angui, please. I, I mean, I really, this is not well thought out, but I can't, I feel I need to say something to our brother at the corner. I really, thank you so much for uh, offering your really important, powerful remarks. I don't know Cape Town at all. In fact, I really don't know how I'm, I'm employed by the University of Cape Town because I'm never here. <laughs> but, I <laughs> but don't tell the dean or don't tell the <laughs> vice chancellor. But as a very unthought out and, uh, and, and I hope not sounding like a surface response, the city, uh, hopefully this room is not definitive of politics for, of Cape Town. It's very troubling to hear that people can't sell alcohol, which is livelihoods and echoes really the policies in Kenya where uh, so many people who live through alcohol are unable to sell their own proper alcohol that they make with their hands, but the alcohol of big corporations is sold everywhere. And I am, without a doubt, uh, the laws that govern them are not the laws that reflect their own experiences. Whether it's racialized experiences or white fragility that inform those laws, or whether it's elite Africans who are not usurping 
uh, their privilege to make sure the city is theirs. And so I'm just, I just wanted to say that I heard your remark. Mine, my response is not well thought out, but I wanted to flag the importance of what you said. And uh, just to say thank you and thank you also to Jenny for, for making those, uh, for your comments as well. Thank you. So all that remains for me is to thank people. Um, and uh, this morning um, there was, uh, you know, I had some slides up and there was, it really takes um, an army of people to make sure that an event like today and the next two days can happen and can happen with joy. Um, and hopefully you could experience that and can attest to it. Um, so, um, but there's, in addition to the people I acknowledged this morning, um, of course there are colleagues that we contract in because we don't have the expertise in-house, which is the AV crew in particular. Um, uh, 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 Dino Trout, Sabri Alice, yeah. and Carson Daniels. Um, and then we've had a photographer um, um, that's been, um, you know, uh, trying his best to catch our best sides. Uh, Michael Hammond, um, not sure if Michael is still here. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> and then I'm sure you'll all agree that the food has been absolutely wonderful. And so Farm Design, Kathy Page and Sam Miller uh, from Farm Design. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, there was a whole kind of crew of people serving food and making sure that as soon as the last morsel is in our mouth, our plate disappears and so on. Uh, so there's a whole group of service and also a cleaning crew that Muldred Seneca has been coordinating, and we are most grateful to them and, again, to the ACC staff and team. But finally, I want to... Um, I want to thank Malik, who's not getting flowers, um, <laughs> uh, for agreeing to, um, uh, you know, pull in as long-standing uh, cheerleader of ACC and officially honorary professor um, for agreeing to chair the scientific panel. That's really <laughs> And, um, and for the rest of the scientific panel and the, the colleagues who supported them. But uh, the person who really makes sure that everything happens as it should is Alma Vivius. Woo! And uh, please come up. So, thank you, as always. Appreciate it. And then finally, the person who oversaw today and the academic conference in particular and has been a fearless leader, Liza Chirulia. Thank you. So this is one of the joys of working at ACC. There's really fabulous people who are incredibly generous and smart and can get their drink on. So that's what we're going to do now. So that brings us to the end of uh, the first day of the Infrastructure Conference. This was the, the day for the nerds. Um, the, the, the sort of uh, policy wonks arrive tomorrow, so behave yourselves, please, or don't. Um, so the next two days, we will have a very different register to the same conversations. Uh, we'll have folk um, who fulfill leadership positions in governments, in infrastructure banks, in um, engineering companies, in actual banks, in real estate companies, in slum dweller movements, um, talk to each other about the questions we've been wrestling about today. Um, I know some of you are joining us for, for the next two days, so thank you for that. But for those who are not, um, please uh, enjoy the last evening with us. Uh, we've got a modest uh, um, feast for you with, with, with beers and burgers, I think, is the theme. 
um, and we are really grateful for everyone's work and effort and contribution, and most importantly, generosity in listening and responding. Thank you very much.